Um, and look, anger is a natural, normal human emotion, and I think sometimes we should be very angry with some of the with some of the legislation that gets put up. But I do worry that when we're constantly going anger, 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 which I feel is kind of the vibe from a lot of politics, I think maybe that's why so many people have actually tuned off from politics. G'day folks and welcome back to Giving What We Can, where we explore how to use our resources to do the most good. Today I'm joined by Emma Hurst, who is a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council, an animal advocate, and although we didn't touch on it in the slightest in the interview, she's also a vegan bodybuilder. We recently had a very interesting conversation at EAGX Australia 2022, but before we get into the interview, I'm joined by my colleague Grace, who we're going to share a few reflections from the interview that we both had. Grace, so what did you love about the interview? I mean, I thought that this was like an excellent example of seeing the principles of effective altruism applied in a policy setting um, and also applied to animal welfare. I thought that the way that she, she tells the story of how they selected different policy interventions to, I guess, fight for in Parliament using this scale, tractability, and neglectedness framework that is, you know, kind of at the heart of effective altruism was just really fascinating and it's something that I, I hope we can see replicated all around the world in policy settings. Yeah, so we don't normally talk with politicians at Giving What We Can because of our focus on charity, but we do cover policy-related interventions, and Emma was fascinating to talk to about that, especially also with her experience as an animal advocate prior to politics and the background she has in psychology as well. Yeah, I think that this is really interesting from a career perspective where we could see people, maybe similar to Emma, who have this background in particular cause area like animal welfare or in global health, then translate that experience into policy interventions and fighting for broader systemic change. A few other things that people can look forward to listening to is how she talks about the success changing laws around animal abuse by showing the connection to human violence and the way that that plays into things like domestic violence and you know policies around working with children checks. Another one was that private charities actually have to fundraise to get criminal laws around animal cruelty enforced. Like, that's completely bonkers. It was kind of eye-opening to me, as someone who is also a vegan in Australia, to actually see, I guess, you know, how far there is still to go in in the policy setting in Australia. Um, But also just to hear Emma's comments around, I guess, how we could be framing uh, things in order to have a bigger impact. So one of the things that she talks about, I guess, is the use of uh, anger as an emotion and how maybe that's turning people off um, and how we might want to lean more into positive emotions. That's something that really resonates with me, um, especially because at Giving What We Can, we represent some of the more positive emotions around what we can change and what we can do. So I thought that was a really valuable uh, reflection from Emma as well, especially seeing her background in psychology. She's also incredibly pragmatic and data-driven. She focuses on what we can do and where the biggest wins are. Yeah, I think that makes it a really uh, fascinating conversation and I think a really good example of how you can actually work to achieve change. Yeah. So without any further ado, uh, let's kick on to the interview with Emma. Thank you, uh, Emma, so much for joining us. It'd be great if you could start off by telling us uh, about yourself and the work that you do at the Animal Justice Party. So my name is Emma Hurst and I'm a member of Parliament for the Animal Justice Party in New South Wales Parliament. Um, So I was elected three years ago. The Animal Justice Party is a fairly new political party, but we were founded because we felt that there wasn't anybody really advocating appropriately for animals in Parliament and there wasn't enough sort of changes happening within that political space in regards to animals. Um, I'm the third MP elected to represent the Animal Justice Party. Um, We had our first MP elected nearly eight years ago, Mark Pearson, Um, and then we've had um, Andy Medic elected just before me, um, and I was the first female elected. And since then, we've also had three councillors elected on a local council level as well. Can you share some of the policy interventions that have been successful so far? So one of the things that we knew we had to do when we got into Parliament was to really change this attitude that issues around animals don't matter. And obviously my background is in psychology. And so what I did was really highlight the link between human and animal abuse um, so that um, politicians realise that this isn't an issue that can continue to be ignored. 
Um, so we changed the legislation, first of all, to recognise that there's a link between domestic violence and animal abuse. Um, we also included animals on apprehended domestic violence orders and we also convinced the Attorney General to put some money towards um, actually helping build refuges to house animals as well that are fleeing violence um, because there was, there's statistics from a lot of research that say that up to 70% of victims delay leaving violence because they don't want to leave the animals behind and there's no opportunities to actually leave with animals. Um, and we've also changed some of the strata laws as well to stop um, animal bans again, because of this domestic violence link, because there's a lack of housing available when people are trying to escape with animals. Mm. Um, we also made some changes in the working with children's check system as well, recognising that link between um, human violence and animal violence. Um, pre previously, before we were elected, somebody could potentially have a severe animal cruelty record mm -hmm. and still work with children. Yeah, and well. So we've changed the working with children's check system so that the higher level offences are automatic um, disqualifications for passing a working with children's check and the lower level offences are now trigger offences so it goes to the children's guardian to determine whether that person is um, a risk to, to be working around children. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about the strategy of like why you have decided to work on those things and how you decide between the different things you could be working on? So when I was first elected we got every single campaign idea that we could think of and put it on a post-it note and then we scaled every single one of those issues um, on three different aspects. So we talked about the neglectedness, is this an issue that other political parties are potentially working on? Um, we also looked at the scales, so how many animals would this affect if we were actually able to get change through? Um, and the other thing we looked at was the winnability and the tractability, so what's the chances that that we will actually be able to get change in this space. Um, and then we picked um, a whole lot of campaigns based on the ones that scored highest on all of those. Yeah. And so even though this isn't necessarily a space where you will see an enormous number of animals affected, mm. it is something that has a lot of tractability and winnability and it will affect both humans and animals. Mm -hmm. Plus, as I said, you know, it really kind of highlights the fact that, you know, when we talk about animals, you know, it's not a separate issue. It, you know, animals, human and the environment, we all interexist and we all have to work together. Um, it's one planet that we're sharing. Um, so it really highlighted that as well and helped to kind of give us traction for our other campaigns. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the idea of momentum and why that's important to you? So it's really important for us to make sure that we've got a whole lot of campaigns that we think are winnable yeah. and it's really important for us to have those winnable campaigns uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, it shows what a minor political party can do. When I was first elected, um, people said, oh, there's only two of you, you're not going to be able to achieve anything. Um, we needed to prove that that's wrong. We needed to prove that if people are voting for a minor party like the Animal Justice Party, um, that we are able to actually win something and get some traction on the work that we're doing. It's also important, I think, for the people who are involved in this movement. Um, animal protection and animal protection campaigning um, tends to take a lot longer than many other um, areas of change. So we need to also build a sense of hope that we can build change and that change is actually possible and we can get to where we need to be. Yeah, speaking of change being possible, have you seen stuff internationally that you've uh, been able to like replicate because it, you've seen it succeed elsewhere? Absolutely. I mean, I'm always looking at what laws are being passed overseas. Mm. Um, so we ended up doing an inquiry onto the use of cetaceans in entertainment. So Canada got a ban. There was some other places around the world that had also enacted bans. Um, we actually met with some of the MPs that were involved in getting that ban in Canada. Um, and one of the MPs was actually um, you know, a vegan... Um, MP as well. Um, so he was really keen to help us in any way possible to make sure that we could do the same in New South Wales. And so we ran an inquiry and eventually we did get um, an end to the use of cetaceans for entertainment. The other one recently that I've kind of borrowed from overseas campaigns um, is the right to release bill. That's getting animals out of medical experimentation and rehomed. Um, so there's been quite a bit of success in different states in the US on that bill um, and we've replicated that here in New South Wales. We've just passed it in the upper house and now it will go to the lower house um, and obviously we'll be putting the pressure on the government to pass it there.
Yeah. What about the reverse? Have you seen uh, people taking some of the wins you've had here um, and learning from that? Definitely. And, and certainly interstate as well. So there's a lot of stuff that we've been working on where I've had MPs from other states actually contact us. Um, so particularly around the domestic violence laws, um, the working with children's laws. We also did um, a range of changes around um, bestiality. So production, possession and distribution of bestiality and animal crush video. Um, so it's only illegal in Tasmania to possess bestiality videos, but it's not illegal in any other state or territory right around the country. So um, we changed those laws in New South Wales, and I've had a lot of interest from other states saying, well, what do those laws look like? How have you written them? How did you get them passed? Um, and most recently, been talking to people around putting those same laws through in the Northern Territory as well. And is that from other parties and individuals as well? Absolutely, yeah. So the Northern Territory, you know, we're not obviously talking to Animal Justice Party MPs because we don't have anyone elected there. Um, and in Queensland, we're talking to Labor MPs um, who are also interested in some of the um, domestic violence changes that we've managed to get passed. So on a related note, um, what's some of the major progress you've seen in both Australia and overseas on the animal welfare in general? So I think, I mean, when we look at the change that has already occurred, I mean, we can see already that, you know, people aren't wearing fur anymore. They don't find wearing fur acceptable anymore. We've seen um, people no longer wanting to attend circuses with wild animals being forced to perform. So we're definitely seeing a large shift. And um, one thing that I was really warmed by in one of my previous roles was, you know, the shift in, in including cetaceans in circus doll tricks. Um, so um, making sure that dolphinariums are no longer acceptable. And there's been this real global shift in attitudes towards actually um, forcing these animals to perform in, you know, backyard pools. We're seeing laws changing all around the world. And I think that there's been quite a large shift probably over the last 10 years where it felt like it was much harder prior to that. So we're seeing changes with people wanting to um, end the maceration of, of day-old male chicks in the egg industry, for example, and even moving into farmed animals, um, which we have um, a lot of difficulty getting the other political parties to um, to support us um, on those issues, which is really, really frustrating. Um, but it's really um, hopeful to see that those changes are happening overseas and also the move towards um, support for plant-based proteins yeah. and for cellular-based agriculture, which are fantastic alternatives because, um, you know, there's not the same environmental damage, there's not the same animal cruelty. And speaking to some of these companies, particularly these cell-based companies, what's really interesting is um, we're talking about some of the health effects of, of saturated fats, of um, other things that are in these products, and they're saying, oh, no, we can take that out because we have full control of what's in there. Um, so we could even see a shift in, in health by people changing their diets to some of these alternatives. Um, so I find that there's a lot of hope in those going forward as well. Yeah, so speaking of Australia being quite an agricultural country, I was speaking with the Good Food Institute recently, they're saying to get these shifts in particularly uh, cellular, they need government scale investment. Um, and when we have a lot of entrenched interests, that can be quite difficult to change. What do you see as that path? Yeah, so there's quite a few different aspects of this. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of it's federal and I'm a state MP. Um, but I have actually met with some of these companies and, and one of these cellular-based startups was Australian and they moved overseas because our laws are so restrictive. Um, so they had found that under Australian law, we can still consider cell, cellular-based agriculture foods to be a novel food, whereas overseas they've recognised that actually it's a novel process to developing the food, but the food itself is exactly the same. Yeah. So it's not a novel food. The, the cheese is still actually cheese. It's just a novel process to actually develop cheese. Um, so we've got some real problems there, and also then there's this massive push around labelling laws, which are, is very, very concerning, um, which you know, I, I believe is coming from a place of trying to confuse consumers um, because we put nut milk on our cereal um, instead of cow's milk, but we don't put nut juice on our cereals. I do think that, you know, we, we need, first of all, a huge shift within Parliament, even just on the animal protection space. We need to re remove animal protection from the agriculture minister. We need a minister for animal protection. We need an independent commission for animal welfare. And once that's separated from the agricultural portfolio, then we can start to look at more of these investments into alternatives because it's no longer 
coming under the agricultural sort of power play you know it's this whole idea of actually investing in this and recognizing that there's a huge opportunity for Australia to be a leader in these alternative proteins and cellular based agriculture. What are some of your proudest achievements so far? Look I think just being elected in and of itself was really, really important. You know, to be able to get elected, you need to have a significant number of of votes and then a significant number of preference votes. And so I think it really indicated to the animal movement that there is support for animal protection throughout the community. And the fact that it's not just one person that's been elected now, there's been three MPs and three councillors. It shows that people do care. They care about animals and they want to see change. Um, But I think maybe some of my biggest achievements, one that comes to mind, it was during during um, the COVID lockdowns and a pound, a rural pound actually shot a mother dog and her puppies, um, despite the fact that two rescue groups were able and legally willing to actually go and get those dogs and find them loving homes. Mm. Um, and so, and there was an investigation and we found that that was entirely legal, that a council doesn't have to work with rescue groups if they don't want to. Um, and they can also kill an animal as soon as they come in. They don't have to actually make any efforts to rehome those animals. Um, so we changed the laws. We rewrote that to make sure that couldn't happen again and it passed in the upper house and then when we started to talk to the government in the lower house um, something very interesting happened the government ended up supporting my legislation Um, the reason that's so interesting is because the government never supports private members bills Um, I think that somebody said it's been 20 years since a private members bill has been supported Um, so for the animal justice party a minor party with two MPs to be able to convince a liberal national government Mm -hmm. to support our legislation when they don't normally support private members bill I think kind of really shows, you know, the the sophistication of the work that we're doing going forward to protect animals. Yeah, and speaking of which, I imagine there's uh, been, you know, as we talked about, a development in in change of hearts and minds. Uh, Can you speak to what you think about the process of changing minds? Look, I think that I think a lot of people already care about animals. I think that the biggest risk we have is people actually tuning out from our message. You know, when I've spoken to journalists about um, wanting to expose animal cruelty issues, they say the issue is that people change the channel. They're not changing the channel because they're disinterested. They're changing the channel because they're too upset. Yeah. It, it hurts too much to see animal cruelty. Um, people will become very, very angry very quickly um, because they see animals as vulnerable and they are vulnerable in many of these situations. I think we still need to make sure our message is truthful and honest and about exactly what it is, but we've got to be careful not to um, evoke emotions of hopelessness. Yeah. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're not evoking emotions of um, despair when, when they see what's happening um, because they're, they're pretty natural reactions. Um, So how do we take these issues and actually make them um, digestible so that people really engage in this process? So a lot of what we focus on at Giving What We Can is how people can use their money to help. Um, Can you talk about the role of uh, philanthropy in helping animals? Yeah, so there's a huge need, obviously, for funding within animal protection. Um, And there's organisations focused on individual change. There's organisations focused on that political change. And then, of course, there's animal charities that are focused on direct rescue of animals as well. And anybody that's looking to donate into one of these charities, I would um, suggest that they consider the campaigns that they're running the work that they're doing and the number of lives that that work will affect. Um, Are they running campaigns that are winnable, that have some tractability? And are they running campaigns that um, are going to affect a large number of animals if they do win? Um, The other thing I would ask them to consider is also, um, is 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 this particular charity looking at an area that is otherwise neglected? Um, So are there a hundred other charities working in the same space? Or is this charity actually tapping into something that is otherwise being neglected and needs to have a light shine on it. So you spent a big part of your earlier career working on individual behaviour change. What recommendations do you have for people who want to be an advocate for animals within their own lives and the people around them? Well, there's a few sort of strategies. One thing that um, the research constantly points to is that Um, the story of the individual is more effective. Mm -hmm. Um, So talking about an individual animal and what they have experienced. But it's the same if you're talking about um, an issue with a person as well. So if you talk about one case example, it tends to resonate better with people. Um, 
And also talking about your own experience. Um, a lot of animal advocates find that people can um, turn off from their message when they're uh, talking about a particular issue at somebody um, and people kind of end up in sort of this argument sort of process. So what we really need to do is talk about our own story and what we learned and what we experienced. And it tends to kind of really calm people down and be much more open to having those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. That's actually something we notice in a, a lot of similar fields. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we find that with giving and everything like that. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing that we as animal advocates, because there's not as much research in our space, we can learn from what you know human rights movements have done and what environmental movements have done and you know taking those strategies and just using them and applying them in the animal space as well. Mm. What do you see as some of the most fundamental problems in animal welfare today that might be more tractable than people expect? Um, oh, the goodness, there's just so much. I think that the enforcement of animal protection um, has really hit a boiling point. Um, we've got this really bizarre situation and it's kind of almost a global problem. I've spoken to people overseas and they've got the same issue. We've got one piece of criminal legislation in Australia that we have to fundraise from the public to uphold the law. And there isn't any other piece of criminal legislation that is run that way, and that's the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. So we've got private charities fundraising from the public to actually investigate and prosecute animal cruelty. Now, if you think about how ridiculous that is, imagine if the police had to organise fun runs to have enough money to investigate and charge drink drivers. I mean, it's absolutely absurd and it, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, in New South Wales, um, the government gives the lowest contribution towards the enforcement of animal protection laws. Um, I think it's something around 2% or less than 2% of the cost of the charity. And then you've got these charities that are talking about having to triage the cruelty cases because they don't have enough money, they don't have enough staff to actually attend every cruelty case that comes through. I mean, first of all, we've got this very weak piece of legislation mm. to protect animals, but then you've got this bizarre structure, which means that it's almost impossible to properly enforce those very weak laws. And every time I talk to somebody about that, they're really quite shocked and surprised and really thinking that we, we need to we need to really change this. And it doesn't matter what their political affiliation yeah. is. When you highlight how bizarre this structural system is and how it's set up to fail animals, everybody comes to the same conclusion. And I think that's, you know, when your question you said, like, that people would be surprised, has that winnability factor? Mm. I think that has a winnability factor. And imagine if we had a proper enforcement system for animal cruelty laws and we had proper laws for animal cruelty as well where we didn't have ex huge exemptions for acts of animal cruelty. Yeah. We seem to have people from, you know, the major political parties uh, within them who do care about these issues a reasonable amount but can't get traction within their own party. How might we overcome this? Look, I think we've got some pressure points and I think that a lot of our campaign work is actually exposing these parties to their voters when they're not supporting really obvious issues. We've just seen in the federal election um, all these teal um, independent MPs take those Liberal left seats through the election. And the Liberal National Government lost power because of it. And it was because they weren't taking environmental issues seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got the same leverage with animal protection issues as well, where um, the Liberal Party have always sort of sat back and said, well, the National Party won't allow us to pass these laws. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, I mentioned that, you know, we put up this right to release bill to get animals out of medical experimentation. And um, I had every single upper house party support me except the Liberal National Government. So everybody supported. We had Greens, we had Labor, we had Independent Justin Field, we had um, the Seniors United, which was formerly Christian Democrats, we had One Nation, and we even had the Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party support this piece of legislation. Um, and then you've got um, the Liberal Party being told by the National Party, no, we're not going to support this. Um, and I think that, you know, when you go to the public and you go to the media and you say that they're not supporting it, the entire party is reflected by those decisions. Mm. 
Can you actually talk a little bit more about the dynamic of the different players, with the you know the media, the you know bureaucrats, the politicians, and and how to like wrangle all of this to get change? Yeah, so probably a really good example was our tougher penalties campaign. Yeah. We had the weakest penalties right across the country in New South Wales. I think the maximum was something like two thousand two hundred dollars for an act of animal cruelty, and we were seeing absolutely pathetic fines um, coming from the court system for really acts of egregious animal cruelty. Mm. So we knew we needed to increase those penalties because we needed um, the court system and also our political system to recognise animal cruelty as the serious crime that it is. So we knew that the government didn't necessarily oppose tougher penalties, but it just wasn't a priority for them. So we had to make it a priority for them. Mm -hmm. So the way we start doing that is every time that there's um, a poor sentence outcome for an act of animal cruelty, we go to the media and we highlight the fact that, um, that the government hasn't acted on this, that we've still got these pathetically weak penalties and that's why we're seeing um, poor outcomes coming through the court system. At the same time, we've got our own petition on, our, on my website, we've got Facebook posts, we tag the minister on every time we do a Facebook post, um, we encourage people to email the minister, um, and then of course we've got budget estimates, which is another opportunity. Um, I'm the deputy chair on the portfolio that oversees the Minister for Agriculture, mm -hmm. so um, a couple of times a year we can question him, why haven't these penalties increased, what's your response to the fact that these penalties have been so weak, that we're the lowest in, in the country, and holding him to account there, asking questions in the House, doing speeches in the House, um, and then when it's still not enough, then we put up our own legislation, mm. and we get the numbers in the Upper House, and we tell the government, we've actually got the numbers in the Upper House to pass this, so then you're going to have to vote against it in the Lower House. Um, so we put our legislation up, and we're about to take it to debate, and then the government introduced their own piece of legislation, which looked very similar to my legislation. <laughs> um, but that gave them the opportunity to say, oh, we are increasing the penalties for animal cruelty. And then I'm quite happy to put my legislation on the shelf and help them push their legislation through. Um, and then we had eightfold increases in, in penalties for animal cruelty. Best kind of plagiarism. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is there a topic that you've changed your mind about recently? One thing I've really been questioning is the use of anger. And it's, it's an emotion that is evoked all the time in politics. You know, if, if you're in the opposition, you're angry with the government because they've put this awful policy through. Um, and look, anger is a natural, normal human emotion. And I think sometimes we should be very angry with some of the, with some of the legislation that gets put up. But I do worry that when we're constantly going anger, 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 which I feel is kind of the vibe from a lot of politics, I think maybe that's why so many people have actually tuned off from politics. And they feel like everything is corrupt, that there's no hope going forward, and so they disconnect. Um, and I think that's really dangerous. I feel like, yes, we can evoke anger, and that can be really effective in the short term, but I wonder if anger has the same effect in the long term, and keeping people engaged in what's going to be a really long battle before we can see, you know, proper laws to protect animals throughout the country. Um, and so I'm wondering, at what levels we use anger and at what levels we, we bring in hope and some of these other emotions, which I don't think are usually, you know, used in political campaigns as much as they should be. Um, so I would, I'm sort of starting to change my mind about anger and, and being really mindful about um, evoking anger in some of the campaigns that we run. Yeah. Speaking of hope, what makes you hopeful? Oh, look, I think that just uh, one thing that I found really helpful for myself is when I've actually sat down and I'm writing Facebook posts and I was actually writing out all of our wins. <laughs> and I was sort of like, oh, this is a really long list of things that we've been able to achieve. Um, and so actually just looking at how far we've come. Um, I was at um, an Animal Justice Party ACT dinner last night and I started talking about some of the wins and somebody said, but hang on, you've only been elected for three years. <laughs> And so you do, you stop and you reflect and you're, okay, this is what we've achieved in three years. Um, and it's not, we haven't only picked winnable campaigns, we're also picking campaigns where we know we have to um, take them on and just keep pushing them. Uh, issues like the use of battery cages and we will continue to push on that. Um, but we also are getting some headway there. Last year we passed um, a motion condemning the agriculture minister um, for failing to, for, well, he, he signed a letter saying that um, New 
South Wales would not ban um, battery cages. Um, so we condemned him for putting that letter ahead when there's still a federal process into whether or not we should do a national phase out of battery cages. I think we're really getting somewhere and that really brings me hope. And I think that those wins are going to get bigger the bigger we come, become as a political party. And our vote is increasing. In the last federal election just months ago, we've doubled our vote in the Senate. Um, so that's really important. The more people we can get elected to represent animals, the more political power we have to get these changes through. Oh, amazing. <laughs> Um, so before we wrap up, uh, is there one takeaway or more that you would like to leave our audience with? I think just, I, I think a lot of people shy away from working and, and, and being involved in the animal protection movement because um, change has historically happened slower than in other movements. Um, but just that this movement is so important. I mean, we're talking about billions and billions of sentient beings. Um, we're talking about enormous environmental degradation by many of the industries that, that use and abuse these animals. And we're also talking about human health. Um, you know, a lot of these products that are being pushed for people to consume more and more and more have research that links them to a variety of health issues that humans are now experiencing. So it's a massive issue and it's one that we can't shy away from. And even even though you know we we've got a long trajectory to go, and even though it's a hard road, I just want to encourage people to to be involved because we are suddenly seeing big leaps and bounds, and I think that we're going to see that speed up very very soon. I think that we're going to see a major shift coming through, um, and we need as many people involved in that and many people donating towards this particular cause to be able to see that major shift come through. Well, thank you so much. Thank you.